everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeannie Breedy from Liquitex. I'm glad that you're joining us today because it's very exciting. We have a new and exclusive launch that is going to be available at Michael's only, and it is called Basics Flu Acrylic Fluid Acrylic. Pardon me. And today we're going to go through some abstract landscape that Marla is going to jump right into. I'll be managing the chat as well if you have any questions, but Marla is going to give you an overview of the product as it compares to our existing uh, product, which is Basics Acrylic, which is our everyday acrylic. So Marla, why don't we just jump right in? Enjoy, oh. everybody. Sounds great, Jeannie. Thanks. So yes, I'm Marla. I'm really looking forward to this. I feel very honored to introduce this new range. And so um, we'll go ahead and get started. So real quickly, I want to show you a couple things you want, want to follow on Instagram. At Liquitex Official, this is the brand of paint that we're using today. Um, and it's a great site to check out on Instagram for everything new and what's going on with Liquitex. At TFAC, NA or TFACNA, uh, that stands for the Fine Art Collective North America. We'll give hour long IG lives, uh, much like this uh, wonderful Mike, Michael Zoom opportunity. And um, there's different artists across the country who will do these based on all different subjects. So you might want to give that a follow. And then I'm at Marla Morrison Art. This is where you'll see my own personal work. I'll do acrylic, watercolor, resin. I do all sorts of different things and I just love sharing it with others. And I love to see what you're up to as well. If you end up painting with me and you'd like to share it and, and I would love to see it, please tag me and also put the hashtag make it with Michaels and Michael hashtag Michaels classes. And that's a great way to get your work out there. And I've seen different um, pieces uh, shared on the Michaels website from classes I've given. So I would love it to see, I would love to see yours up there as well. We are gonna work at a brisk pace today because I wanna make sure that we can get everything in, but I don't think it's gonna be too rushed. I just wanna tell you that we're gonna work at a, a, a nice a brisk pace. All right. So this is the piece we're going to make. It is an abstract landscape made with our basics acrylic fluid. This is an what I consider like an everyday acrylic, something that when you're ready to start painting with acrylics and it may be new to you, it's a fantastic range to pick up and get started with. If you've used our original basics acrylic, this is it's the same family. All right. Um, what you'll see is the basics uh, fluid is going to have a, obviously a more fluid flowy texture and it's going to be great for detailed work. It's also extremely versatile like the um, traditional basics, but uh, I think you'll see as we're painting that it's going to have its own unique attributes as well. I wanted to show that we have, um, there's 48 colors in the range. Michaels has an exclusive with the basics acrylic fluids at this point, and there are 42 colors available through Michaels. And I just, this is just a quick little sample to give you an idea of what we have available. Um, and this is a board just to show how here's your traditional basics or the original basics, and then this is the basics fluid. So the colors are going to match. You're going to see that the pigment load is same across the range. It's going to be quite a bit of different. Uh, it's going to be about the textural difference and how it performs when you're painting. And I just like this one because, you know, all the colors, right? This was just done with a rainbow of colors and just a draw down with a large palette knife. And of course, it's we're going to do more of kind of a graphic, a um, hard edge piece. But this I wanted to show because you can also use very fluid uh, brush stroke, obviously, as the name suggests. So that's one example. And you can also do kind of quick floral studies or things like that with the basics fluid because it's excellent covering power as well. And then last but not least, this is a, a landscape that's kind of in between, um, a little bit more rendering of the mountains and the uh, greenery and the sky is a bit looser. But yet another example of what you can do with the basics fluid. I did see in the chat someone mentioned right off the bat if they could use a different acrylic. You can just know that everything we're going to be talking about is going to be specific to the attributes of basics acrylic fluid. And so, um, you know, this kind of painting is ideal for using this more fluid texture. Now I'm using a nine by 12 canvas. It is pre-primed um, in the notes. It did mention that it's a good idea to have put an additional coat of gesso on. Don't panic if you didn't do that. That's OK. I just found it a little bit nicer just to have that extra coat of gesso on a pre-primed surface. Um, I did go ahead and start sketching mine in. Um, there was a printout available to get started. And I see, yeah, no, you already have to, you don't already have to have the drawing on it. I wanted to block mine in. So as I'm talking, I can get it right. Sometimes when I'm talking and drawing, I feel like I missed the mark. So <laughs> I will walk you through this part. I just wanted to have a little bit 
bit of it sketched down first. So we have it in portrait format. I just have a regular pencil here and I'm just gonna get close to this original um, drawing, all right? Because that's what we're here to paint. So I ended up starting at the bottom and I kind of went like an inch up from the bottom and just did an arcing motion to the other side of the canvas about what is that? I guess about four inches up. And then we've got two kind of a uh, hill mark or three hill marks going this way. So I kind of went just slightly above the halfway point and just did a simple arc shape down. And again, you don't have to be super precise with this because you're gonna, if, you, if your pencil line is shaky like mine is, or if you over mark an area, you're gonna be able to cover it with the basics fluid. Then we'll just do another arc mark a you know, with about a, going from about a half inch to an inch and a quarter, or, yeah, inch and a quarter width to the bottom, okay? To the bottom of this arch. And then another on top. And now we're kind of at a little bit lower than halfway point on this side, okay? And again, don't, you don't have to get it perfect. It's just, this is the basic structure of your hills. Okay. Now we're going to do the more rocky mountainous part. So I'm going to start with this shape here. And it's a little, so if this is the halfway point of your canvas, I'm a little to the left of the halfway mark. And I'm just going to imagine kind of like a, a rocky, hilly silhouette. And I may end up changing this in the actual painting, but that's kind of the idea. I want to remind myself that this is a, a rocky ridge. And then when we're drawing this part in, we're gonna start probably, let's say about two and a half inches down from the top. And we're gonna do a peak. I'm kind of looking, I wanna split the difference here. So I'm gonna do a peak at this point. And now I'm gonna come down. And again, I'm just kind of imagining a cascading rocky ridge and I'm not really caring too much about, you know, does this look perfect? I'm just kind of drawing a, a rocky ridge. And then I'm gonna come up to a point here and come back down. Now I don't want these two points to be the same height. So I'm actually gonna correct that very quickly. I just don't think that looks as good design wise. And if you have the drawing that was available, hopefully you would have just um, you know, done kind of a carbon transfer where you color the back with pencil, flip it over and then retrace. Um, but again, it's pretty, we're, we're doing it. It's, it's pretty quick just to sketch it out. All right, so I just boosted that peak a bit because I want it to be a little, I want it to be, um, I didn't want it to be parallel with this peak, okay? Now for the sun, just grab one of your basics fluid jars. And if you don't have that, grab something else that's easy for you to make a circle if possible. And if you don't have that, um, like if you had a, like the bottom of a cup or something like that handy, that's a, a quick way to make a circle. But I'm just gonna trace around in the upper right of the landscape, okay? And then we've got three kind of wispy clouds. So I'll put one above my mountaintop here. Now I'll just kind of get a nice little wispy mark. And then I want one bisecting the moon, or I'm sorry, the sun here. I think of a Halloween moon when I see these kind of clouds too. Okay, and then we'll have one little one down here in the valley of these two clouds. And again, you can adjust this as you're painting. We're not going to put the trees in yet because there would be no point because we're going to end up painting over it anyway. So we're not going to draw the trees in, but you've hopefully you've got your, your hilly shapes, your mountain shapes, and now your sun and your wispy clouds. All right. So we've got that sketched in. And when I was painting this too, I started from the bottom and went upwards. And I think for me, it's like I was asking myself, why did I do that? Because sometimes I'll approach paintings in a different way. And I think what made sense to me is I'm starting with my darker value colors first and then going a bit lighter. And I think it just made sense for the composition of the painting and really practically just the cleaning of the brush and um, just having your darker colors first. And then um, as you go, it gets a little bit lighter and lighter. Okay, so the first color we're gonna mix and we are gonna do a decent amount of color mixing. So be sure and have a palette knife handy. This is uh, probably my favorite 
palette knife for mixing on this scale. It's our number 16 of the Liquitex free freestyle. But if you have a different one that you like, you should be able to mix with that as well. Um, you can see I haven't cleaned mine recently, but if when I'm ready, I can soak this in water and then use like a um, bristle brush or something like that to clean the, the extra paint off. And the, since it's stainless steel, it's not going to rust. So I do love our palette knives for that reason. So we're starting with this darker value kind of blue green. So we're going to start with our primary blue and our phthalo green. And you'll see just real quickly, you're going to see that the, um, a great majority of the colors that we have today are semi-opaque. And that's a way to see that is just this little square here on the label. See how it's half black and half white? That tells you that this is a semi-opaque color. So in order to get this kind of velvety look, we're going to end up doing two coats with um, most of these colors just to get it nice and rich. OK, um, you'll notice, too, that we're using fine art pigments in the basics fluid and they have the same light fastness standards as our professional series. So just because it's an everyday acrylic doesn't mean you're sacrificing quality. It's just a, it's a different uh, palette size and it's a good way to get introduced into the world of acrylic painting. On my pat, on my pat, Jeannie, were you going to say something or no? I just heard something break in. Okay. On my palette over here, I put down the primary blue and this is probably a little bit bigger than, well, maybe nickel size amount of paint and a little bit bigger than a dime size of the green. I am not super precise mixer. I have to tell you, um, I, I guesstimate. And then as I mix, I will tweak as I go. So um, please feel free to do that as well. And don't get too panicked if it's not working out. I can, because um, for me, sometimes I'll mix it. I'm like, nope, I need to add more of this color. I just find it a more pleasant way to work. And so that's how you'll see me mixing these. But I will come down here so you can see a little bit closer what I'm doing. All right. And then we also want a touch of the black down too, because we're going to soften the intensity of the color just a touch. So get a little dab of your Mars black and just off to the side, you can put it here. And receipt, you can see if you've not squeezed these out, you can see that it's really easy to do so with the bottle. It flows out nicely. And I just love how the colors just kind of puddle on their own. I was thinking it'd be fun just to make a painting just of these dots and just let them be because it's such a kind of pleasing shape. But obviously today we're going to tear into the dots and mix them. So take about one um, of that nickel size amount. I'm gonna take about half the color and I'm gonna take half of the dime size amount of the green. So it's roughly a one-to-one -one proportion of the blue and the green. And I wanna make sure I have enough. So I'm actually gonna take more of each now that I feel pretty good about the color I'm getting here. And since it's going the right direction, I'm going to go ahead and take the rest. So sometimes I'll do that too. I'll kind of do a little test mix before I commit to using all my color to make sure it's going. Where I hope okay. So now I've got this uh, kind of a, a kind of a brighter teal color, and I want to soften it a bit or make it a bit more. Um, toned down. So I'm just going to take my palette knife and dab it in that Mars black. So there's barely any on my knife. You can see it's just a dab. And now I'm going to mix it into my blue and green mixture. And that's where you get a really lovely um, depth to this color. And, um, you know, colors are great, bright and vibrant right out of the container. But what I have enjoyed about using the basics fluids is that they mix nicely. They don't, uh, sometimes when you mix um, less quality brands of color, your mix can look a little dull or drab or not, not toned down and still pleasing. The mixes of these colors have looked really, um, really rich to me. I'm going to take one more little dab here of my black. It's always easier to add more than it is to try and take away, right? So that's kind of how I approach color mixing. And if you've not done a lot of mixing, I'm just using my knife to scrape the edge and push it to a center pile. And then I kind of mash it down with my knife. So it's like scraping and mashing. And most people really enjoy that kind of that process. And oh yeah, and one other thing I'm gonna do, do you see how when this is spreading out, remember I mentioned that the color is semi um, opaque. 
there's a slight bit of transparency that in order to help us get that more velvety mat, we're actually going to add a tiny amount of what a tiny, tiny bit of white. So go ahead and grab your titanium white. And we'll just put a dab. This tiny dab is all you need. We can get out more as we need it. But now that we've got our base color mix, we're going to just take a touch of this titanium white and mix it into our blue, black, and green. And that will give us a little bit more opacity for layering. And you can see that kind of bumps it into, hopefully you can see that it bumps it into the uh, much more close to the color which we're trying to achieve. It looks a lot darker here, but when we spread it out on the white, um, it will, it'll look closer, okay? So we can go ahead and take all the color off of our knives and then I'll zoom back up here. And so I'll clean off my knife, the paper towel, and then I'm going to take the larger of the two brushes that you have for this demo. This is the size 10 flat. If you have a different flat brush, that's, that should be fine to use. I just like a flat for this project because it gives you good coverage and it gives you crispy edges where you need them. That's the benefit of a flat brush. Lots of coverage and crispy tight edges if needed. So I'll just uh, dip it in my paint and just begin. We're gonna start with this lower fill shape and I'm going to very liberally um, put out my color. And I'm not worried about what the brush strokes look like really at this point. I'm just kind of just getting it down. So once we mix the color, you know, it goes pretty quickly. It's just taking the time to mix it and get it the um, specific hue that we want. And on your canvas, because this is, the paint is um, fluid, I've noticed that it, sometimes you have to um, kind of make sure it gets into the fibers of the canvas. The second coat is a little um, smoother to, to apply. Okay. And you could see if you wanted, you could in person, you know, I, it might be hard to see on the screen, but if you wanted to leave a more brush stroke look, the fluids will do that for you. Just to keep the more graphic quality though, um, we're gonna be doing two coats. Now here's where I'm using the advantage of the flat brush. And I'm just getting that crispy edge up against that hill edge where I want it to be and just painting it across. And don't worry if you don't go exactly where your drawing was, that's okay. Um, it's not, uh, not anything to worry about. All right, so kind of get that down. I'm just smoothing it out a bit since I don't want to, I don't, I personally don't want a lot of visible brush stroking in this because again, we're kind of going for more of a graphic look. So we're going to leave that there and we're going to let that dry. And we're going to move to our next color. Now, this is a case too where I anticipate we're going to need to mix more of this color when we do the second layer. Again, part of that is because we're going to use the color we've already mixed to make our second hill shape. Okay, so we've got hopefully you have a little bit of excess color from where you just mixed. And what we're going to do now is, um, you know what, we can just go ahead and add because we're going to need a little bit more. So let's go ahead and just add more. Sorry, sometimes I'm just thinking as I go here, guys, So or, or everyone. So I'm going to take the primary blue and put a bit more down, probably again about a nickel size amount. Okay, And I'll do the same with the um, phthalo green. I'll do about a little less than a nickel size amount. And I've already got my black and my white, so I don't need to put that out again. And I'm going to hit, and since I know the ratio, I'm going to go ahead and mix half and half. I'm gonna mix the whole amount. I mean, it's half blue, essentially half blue and half green. And then I'm going to mix that fairly quickly. And then I think what I'll do is I'm going to pull about half of that mixture down so we can reserve this top part to repaint the bottom hill since we went ahead and remixed. Okay, so we're pulling half of that color down. You notice I haven't cleaned my brush yet because we're gonna be um, using it for this second hill color. So I've got to add some black. So I just take a touch of black again. 
mix that in. I'll take one more dab following the formula from before. So two dabs of black to that pile of my teal blue, that deepens it. And then we'll take one dab of white. So that gets it back to the color we had before. But now since we're making this lighter um, hill shape, we're gonna add more white, all right? And for this case, I'm gonna add more white to my palette. And now, so we added a dab, we got it back to this original hill, hill color, but now we wanna make another, uh, make it a bit lighter. So what you're gonna do is you'll take your palette knife, and I didn't even clean mine. You can see it's okay, that's fine. And I took kind of a, um, just a, a gentle scoop of the white onto my palette knife, and I'm going to mix that in. And what this is doing, obviously titanium white is probably the most popular color we make. Um, a lot of paintings have a huge percentage of white because it can, do a lot of neat things. You can mix your color and all of a sudden, just by adding white, you've got a lighter value in the same family. And it just adds a lot of, um, it offers a lot of variety without having to, you know, have 200 bottle, bottles of different paint color. So let's take a look. Let's see how that looks. Um, pretty close. Maybe this is slightly greener but we're gonna go with it since this is based on what we have down here. All right, so I've got that mixed. Clean off my palette knife. And what I'll do now, um, just to keep it nice and, and even, I'm gonna wipe my brush and I will go ahead and uh, rinse it in water. I just, this is my water bucket. I just have this um, water bucket that is well loved. I have two vessels in it. Uh, this side, I do my rough rinse of the color. And then over here, I'll dip the brush to do that, the final rinse. So you can see how that helps clean my brush quickly and, and keeps some clean wash water. So it's nice if you don't have something like that, if you have two um, different containers for water, that's another way you can approach it. Okay, so I'll take the same brush, I'll dip it in our lighter teal mixture. And just going to quickly paint it in, in this shape. And hopefully you're enjoying just brushing that color on the surface and get zoning into that wonderful fluid texture. Something that's nice about um, the fluids as well, which we'll see when we do the trees, is that the basics fluids are um, fantastic for detail work. So whether it's this, this ease of doing this crispy edge here or doing the delicate little trees that we're gonna do in, in a, just a moment, a little moment down the way, um, the fluids are really nice at that. And here's another example too, after we brush this out up here, I'm going to do the line with the, of this lighter value um, teal with the darker value. And I'm just gonna start at the bottom and it's gonna be with this flat brush and this basic fluid, it's gonna be quite nice to paint these two colors together because sometimes when you use a thicker texture paint, even like our um, original basics, you could do a painting like this. And some of you might be using our basics or a different color, but you're gonna get that little thick ridge. Do you guys know, or do y'all know what I'm talking about? It's that ridge where um, the paint is thicker. And when you make a brush stroke, it makes a kind of a thicker ridge of paint. Uh, with the fluids, I've noticed that doesn't happen. It, uh, is nice and fluid and even. And you notice I don't have to add water to it. It's ready to go right out of the container, which is pretty fabulous because sometimes adding water, well, no, not sometimes, but anytime you add uh, any amount of water, you're going to dilute the color to some degree. And so since you don't have to add water to have such a nice flow to the basics fluid, you're getting the most brilliant color you know, possible based on whether it's out of the bottle or in a mix. 
All right, so that's nice. We've got that down. And again, my uh, the one I'm painting today is a little greener than this, but I think it will still be a nice a nice blend. And then the next um, hill shape here is going to have more titanium white added. So what we can do, because I think this color is going to be opaque enough where we don't really have to do a second coat because we had enough white in it. So speaking to that, just make sure your this hill shape uh, is uh, has the smooth brush stroke. If you really like that graphic quality, just want to smooth out the brush stroke. And then I'll do the same thing. I'll take a paper towel. I'll squeeze out the excess color. That helps keep your wash water cleaner if you can squeeze it out before you rinse it in water. And then I'll do my double rinse and just set it down. And then now what we're going to do is we're going to take this color and add more white to it to create that third uh, receding hill. And so what I did, I took, uh, I should have shown you, sorry about that. I'll show you. I had about this much white down on my knife and I just mix that into the blue. Okay, so I'd say like four dabs of white mixed into the remaining blue because you don't need a ton of this remaining uh, blue green color. And I think what I want to do, this is not um, light enough, so I am going to take more of the white. So another kind of stroke or volume of the on the palette knife. So again, like three or four dabs at once on the palette knife. And we'll mix that in. Kind of adjusting as you go, using your artist eye to see, do I like this value of color with the ones I already have? So another way I'll do that is I'll hold my palette knife next to the colors already on the canvas. And I feel like it's 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 close and I, it's hard to see with the sheen, mate, that's better. It's close, but it's still not light enough. I want it to be a little lighter in order to pop uh, a bit more. So I'm gonna take the titanium white, I'll squeeze probably, it's like another dime size amount of the titanium white on my palette. I got a little excited there and tilted it. And I'll do the same thing. I'll take another palette knife dab. This is probably like five dabs of the white at once. Again, I tend to be on the kind of more conservative side when I'm mixing. I have to go back several times because if I get too excited about it and I mix a whole bunch all at once, it's, it can be hard to correct it. So I'd rather, I'd rather adjust it slowly and check myself rather than, you know, stub my toe and add too much all at once. So let's do another pass at it. So we're talking about four to five dabs. And we're getting there. That's probably about where I want it. If you want yours to be a little bit bluer, like the example, you could add a dab more of the, the uh, primary blue at this point, but I'm gonna continue with my slightly greener palette. And it'll contrast with our gray blue sky, I think, nicely. All right, so I'll take my paper towel and clean off my palette knife again. And I'm going to take my size 10 brush, dip it in my newly mixed color, and just begin to paint it down. All right. And so wherever you butt up to the color that you already have there, just I end up going a little more slowly just to make sure I can be careful with it. But again, even though this is a big brush, you can use it to your advantage. See, I'm dragging downward against the edge of the hill shape here. And I'm actually covering up a little bit of the color there just to get a smooth curve. So don't hesitate to do that if you need to. But when it comes to this, to this little um, uh, corner here. I'll take a little bit more paint and I've switched my knife to move in this direction. So I'm butting up the corner of that knife or the edge of, uh, you know, the this corner of, uh, not knife, sorry, the corner of the brush into the corner of the hills and stroking this way. So use the angles of your brush to your advantage. Move the brush where you need it to go in order to fill the shapes in easily that you have. And something else I've noticed as I paint with this, sometimes instead of painting flat like this, I will turn my brush on its end like this. And, and I just, I think that gives me a different sense of kind of control as I'm painting, especially at this narrower part here. 
where I, um, if I did the flat part, I would go over the line. So I want it to just, I'm using the, the thin of edge of the brush to uh, brush downward using the thin edge. So hopefully that makes sense. Don't ever hesitate to move your brush in your hand in order for it to be the most effective painting tool for you. And to that point, don't hesitate to turn your canvas as needed. I find that to be really helpful as well. So because I, I'm working in a more narrow space, I've turned my canvas on edge and now I'm going to use the um, this part of my brush. Oh, sorry, you can't see my finger. I'm gonna use this part of the brush to, to do this uh, edge here. And I'm doing a bit of a back and forth motion just to kind of get it, um, make sure it's secure into the canvas. Uh, and what, what I mean by that is make sure that it's filling the, the hollows of the canvas nicely. Again, it's not um, something that I'm fretting over if I kind of get out of my pencil line. Now, again, we're to, the, we're to an edge here so I can take the corner of the brush and the flatness of the edge and go right to the edge of these two hill shapes. I'm going to turn my canvas, get a little more paint on my brush, and now I'm going to um, meet this edge with the flat, the, the top of my flat brush. All right. And if you have, like I have a pretty thick layer of paint on here, What's nice about the fluids is again, when these dry, that ridgy look is going to be quite minimized. You can also brush it out a bit to make sure that it's minimized, but compared to other paints with a, with a thicker texture right out of the container, you're not gonna have those, um, what I find kind of unsightly ridges. I I've never really enjoyed that part. Oh, and look what I did, I need to clean that up a bit. Never really enjoyed that part of hard edge painting when you get those paint ridges. So that's why I'm really happy that with the fluids, um, that is something you don't have to worry about. All right, so we've got this hill, uh, the slightly lighter value and our lightest value of the blue greens. Now we're gonna move to sienna, light sienna, and then our gold. Uh, I think before we move out of the blues, I actually am going to, since now our bottom hill is touch dry, we're going to use the um, the other part of the blue that we mixed and paint over uh, the, the bottom hill shape. So I'm going to clean this brush, wash it in water, put it in my rinse water, my second rinse water, and then dry. And that's the nice thing too. I'm, I'm pretty much just squeeze drying my brush because again, I don't need any water in here. Now, I think I got ahead of myself when I was mixing this originally and I didn't add the black or the white. So let's do that quickly. Uh, sorry about that, everyone. I just forgot to do that. So let's take your palette knife and take a tiny dab of the black and we'll mix it into the top blue that we had pre-mixed here. And then we will, after that's mixed, we can again, just take the same palette knife, dab it in your white, get a small dab of the white on the palette knife and mix it here. So it's like, once you've mixed your color, it can be quick and easy to, to remix as needed during your painting session. Cause that's, what's nice about these two. They don't, um, when they're spread on the surface, they will dry in a fairly rapid amount of time, but when you have them sitting on a palette in a decent size volume, you'll still have enough um, mixing time or working time. The other thing too, if you're ever disturbed by how quickly acrylics dry, just put a humidifier in your studio or, and, or get rid of any hot lamps that might be gazing down on your painting because anything that it helps with water evaporation will help acrylics dry more quickly. So if you're finding that your color is drying too quickly, just add a humidifier to your studio. All right, so we're gonna need to give a second coat to this bottom layer with the blue we just mixed. And this should go quite quickly because again, you're just filling in where you've already painted. And this is another point to say too, I don't know if you've ever done glazing before, but glazing is a technique where you layer transparent veils of color on top of each other. Here we are glazing, but we're not trying to see the layer underneath necessarily. So we're technically adding a thin layer on top of another layer, but we're not exactly getting a traditional glazing effect. We're just kind of making it a bit more opaque since we didn't want to add too much white 
to this color. But yeah, so the, all that to say the basics fluids uh, really do lend themselves to a glazing technique, which is popular in um, oil and watercolor, but with acrylics, you can, you can do it nicely as well. Hi, Marla, it's Jeannie. Yeah. Uh, we're getting yeah. some interesting chats. Everyone seems quite excited about the new basics um, acrylic fluid. Um, awesome. One of the questions that it, it does appear because they do look quite vibrant um, mm -hmm. as compared to um, probably just maybe the camera angles or whatever, but I think it's the fluidity, that velvety, easy flowing consistency because the pigments are pretty much on par with what we have um, in the existing line because it was created to have parity with the basics acrylics. Would you say that? Yes. True, because she's saying they look more vibrant than the basics, but I'd say. Interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a great thing to bring up. But yeah, I do think it could be kind of how we're seeing it painted live here. But in my experience, the vibrancy is the same as the traditional or the original basics. It could be a textural difference too, because sometimes mm -hmm. if something is smooth and flat on camera, it just has a certain kind of power that something with a lot of texture has different light hitting on it, mm -hmm. could diffuse the color and how it looks. But that is a great observation. Yeah. It, it It is quite brilliant, but um, I wouldn't say that you know, it's more because my understanding, I'm not a chemist and I don't know how they make all this stuff, but um, I, I think they use probably a similar proportion of pigment to color for each one. So would they, in a drawdown side by side, they're going to look quite similar, but the textures could, uh, could change the way we see it for sure. Yeah, that would be true. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that um, even the color palette that you selected, you know, we tried to come up with something that would be on point with the trends that it with that mid-century modern so they're a little more saturated as well yes and, and you they play off each other yeah. yeah and you and we'll see that now as you create some of the contrast it's going to look really good i just want to let you know we're at 237 and you're moving along quite nicely so i think we'll be right. fine good 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 so and something uh, everyone i think i forgot to mention before um and it says it on the back of the container when you so it, if you ran into something that didn't seem quite right just make make sure that when you get a bottle shake it well before you start painting this is unusual in the world of acrylics or mediums usually that's not something that we'd ask you to do but with the basics fluid it is a good idea to do it um and you know, it's just a from painting with it, I've just noticed it kind of helps if, if any of the pigment or color has settled in the bottle, it just helps kind of re energize it for lack of a better way of saying it. So I forgot to say that earlier, but um, don't be don't be afraid to shake these a bit before you start painting with them. So I've picked up the burnt sienna and I'm going to squeeze out. Let's I want let's see if I can anticipate better. Let's squeeze out oh, say bigger than a quarter size amount of the burnt sienna. And we'll pick up the titanium white again. And this, I'll put it over here so I can dab into it as needed. We'll go ahead and put like a quarter size amount of the titanium white. Uh, pick up your palette knife again. And this is the color we're aiming to match. So it's a sienna with titanium white. So we're not going to we're not going to just add white to this. What we're going to do is we're going to pull some of the sienna downward. It's easy to do because it's so fluid. And now we will take. Um, you can drag it over like I'm going to do, or pick it up. We'll take about half of that quarter size amount of titanium white and we're going to mix it and let's see if that gets us pretty close to where I want to be here for this painting. So the nice thing about adding uh, titanium white is it does uh, help add opacity which is wonderful for these more graphic styles. And you'll see that that the nice thing about the fluid is that even though you're adding white, the brilliance doesn't kind of turn like a yucky. Oh, what's the word? Like a it it doesn't. Sometimes I've added white to different brands of color, and they can get look a little too soft and quiet, and not in a good way. Um, but what's nice about the, the fluids I've noticed is you can add a good amount of white, and it will still have that uh, brilliance of pigment showing through. So I think this is pretty close. It may be a little bit lighter, but something to know too: acrylics slightly darken down as they dry, and so 
that that sienna will be a little bit deeper yeah yeah oh yes Jeannie. another question for you which is actually yeah. good. Um, marla was one of our artists that was trialing um the basics fluid before it came to market so a question was did you have a chance to mix the fluids with the basics because um they're obviously they were meant to interact because the pigments are sure wrong. as far as i guess the uh artist is asking i guess how, what was your experience with it like did you find them you know Sure. Uh, yeah, let me speak to that. Let me say what I just did real quick, though, so people know what I just did. So I actually I decided to make this a little bit deeper. So I took about probably four or five dabs of the Sienna. I'm going to take another four or five dabs. So like 10 extra dabs of Sienna. I'm going to deepen it slightly. So yeah, did I have a chance? Yes, I did have a chance to work with them together. Mixing them, obviously, you get kind of something in between the two texture wise. But what's neat is when you mix the fluid with the tradition or the original or traditional basics, um, it, some of that fluidity transfers to that thicker texture basics. So even though the basics is quite brushable, uh, adding the basics fluid to it um, gives you a little more brushability. And um, so that's one thing I noticed uh, color for color. They are, you know, it was hard for me to see, you know, working it was hard for me to see much of a difference between if I was using like the um, cat orange shoe with the basics cat orange shoe. They, they just look very, very, very similar. Um, so I would say that I probably, in my own work, I don't know that I'd feel the need to mix them for any specific effect, but what I could see doing more frequently is would be layering on the same painting, like blocking in the backgrounds or whatnot with the fluid and then reserving the basics uh, original for more textural passages. And that's something that I did play with. Uh, so that to me is how I would more uh, relevantly use it in my own work. But yeah, there's absolutely no problem mixing them together. And you might like the, the result, that kind of in-between basics and basics fluid effect. So yeah, definitely experiment because that's what's so great. You know, I love how Liquitex will bring new offerings to us as artists and then we get to decide how we want to play with it and see what we can come up with for sure. So it's a definitely, yeah. And if you experiment with it and love it, I would love to see how you decide to use it. So be sure and tag me with that if you don't mind because um, it's always good to see what other artists are enjoying with yeah. the material. Actually, that, that's such a great idea because everyone's experience, we try to get um, a lot of artists, like what was the feeling what, that it emoted in you? Like to me, I felt like it was very like effortless. It was very like, mm. I felt like it was just, I keep saying fluid, but the flow, mm. like it was like when you, you have like some resistance with the basics and with the fluid, it just felt a little more effortless and uh, oh, yeah effortless is it yeah I think effortless yeah. is a great word but it is it's like a nice smooth and the same thing with not only get in touch with Marla um but um also if you do the hashtag with Michaels um because as we're launching this this is the only place where you're going to buy it and find it they have UGC galleries so sometimes they'll go in and they'll look at um if you tag Michaels in your post of a new and interesting way that you're introducing a new product as well as some kind of art, you could be selected to go on their UGC gallery, which is kind of cool because that goes an email to, you know, a lot of artists in the United States and Canada. So yeah, that is share great. your creativity with us. So we have lots of different platforms for you to do that. So, you know, everybody's going to learn from this. So we're really happy about uh, bringing it to Michael's because it's a great platform. And um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. This, this artwork is coming together nicely. So I'm happy to good. see the progress. Good, good. So I think all of you are probably comfortable with how we just brush this in. This, this sienna and white uh, combo just gets brushed in the, um, the next kind of uh, receding hill shape. And then that will dry and we're going to add white to some of this sienna to make the, now we're getting into one of our Rocky Mountain shapes here. So I'm what I'll do with my brush, I'm going to just squeeze the color off. I'm not gonna rinse it though, um, just, just because I don't feel like I need to rinse it, but the color, the sienna and white that we mix, I'm going to take about half of that mixture and just spread it aside to the side. And now I'm going to take half of my remaining white and we'll start there to see if that's going to get me close to where I want to be with 
the next sienna and white combo. And we're gonna add a little bit more white. So another like four to five dabs. It's that's it's a little hard to describe how you're what the volume on a fluid amount when you're just scraping, but that's kind of the idea. Just imagining if it's one dab, you get four or five more of those similar dabs on there. And so comparing on the palette, that's pretty close. I think comparing with what I have on the canvas is close. And something I want to do too, to make this a little bit uh, more atmospheric, this, I'm going to go back up to your Mars Black and take a tiny dab on your palette, and we're going to mix that in hmm. as well. So that's going to just soften a little of the um, intensity of that sienna and help it look a little bit more in the kind of that atmospheric background. And that's the other cool thing too. I talked about when you add white, sometimes it can go kind of a, oh, a uh, not very pleasing light pastel, whereas with yeah. the big fluid, it doesn't. But I, the other thing that can be kind of hair raising is if you add black to a color, it can be dominant and kind of muddy. muddy. But that's what's nice. If you even you just add a dab, it changes the uh, tone of the color, but it doesn't make it look uh, muddy. Um, it, it, it just changes the tone and softens it. So that's another cool attribute. So I didn't clean my brush. I just, I just squeezed it with a palette knife because it's, it's, um, partly I'm, you know, I try to minimize my steps here <laughs> and partly it, it's not required to have to do that. Uh, so now we can brush in the rocky portion here. And you can see, I just attack it by, uh, putting the volume of color in the bigger part of the shape. And then this is like painting a wall, right? When you paint the wall, you, most people, I mean, I don't know, not everyone, I guess, but a lot of people will do the larger part of the wall. And then you start to do the detailed edges um, by the ceiling or by the baseboard or whatnot. So. Well, a couple more questions. It's just yeah. seems like, you know, comparative to other mediums, um, particularly, okay. um, how does it perform against gouache? Now, mm. um, we have our own professional range of acrylic gouache, which is very matte and very opaque. Mm -hmm. So it is quite different. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, this is someone that's new to art and she's just asking, you know, yes. does it feel, does it have or emulate any of the qualities that a gouache would have? Yes, no, that's a fantastic question. And really as an artist kind of working with these different um, colors, I would say that of our color offerings, I do think our professional acrylic gouache and the basic fluid do have a lot in common. Um, but to Jeannie's point, the, uh, the professional acrylic gouache is um, much more opaque right out of the bottle. And it's much more of a velvety matte sheen, whereas the basics fluid, when you see, it's hard to see because this is wet on screen, but, and you're still working with it wet, but when you're, when yours dries, hopefully you'll see that it's more of a soft satin. And so in, if, if you don't have our acrylic gouache, you'll notice that the gouache is much more of like looking at a piece of velvet. And so the sheen is different. The opacity is different. Also, even though our professional acrylic gouache uh, you don't have to add water to it when you're working. It is a little bit thicker in texture. Mm -hmm. And so the brushability is different. It's still, I think it's still easy brushing, but it's different. This, like Jeannie was talking about, it's hard to kind of grab the right word, but this kind of has a flow or, um, oh, there's probably a really nice word that I can't <laughs> think of. It just has a, a, a sensation to it that glides in a different way. Yeah. I mean, I guess artists will call it drag. Like, so the drag is different and the exactly. feel is different. So yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's so, like that push and pull, like mm -hmm. it felt like it was just a lot more effortless. It was real more yeah. free flowing. Um, another thing is just different surfaces. I know that you were trialing this on different surfaces. Mm -hmm. I was asking about um, putting it on a plastic container mm -hmm. and because the chance of yeah. that flaking off. Now, I know I've had that experience before. So any, any, tips, any ideas, any feedback you'd like to offer? Sure. Yeah. And that's a great question. I didn't do a lot of testing on plastic, um, but the, but since these are an acrylic, uh, I believe the same acrylic painting rules apply. So there's a acrylics will stick to most plastics. I would not anticipate this not being able to do it, but what you have to make sure of is that you're not actually using a vinyl they don't, acrylics don't like vinyl. Um, you also, if it's a very, very slick plastic, you can always slightly abrade it and that will help out with mm -hmm. adhesion. 
Um, and obviously too, if since this is a new paint medium and with your particular plastic that you like using, don't be afraid to do what's called just a test piece. And that would be where you could slightly abrade your plastic, paint some of the paint sticks fluid down, let it dry for 24 hours, and then do some slight crosshatch marks through the basics fluid down to the plastic. Then take a piece of masking tape and rub it firmly on those crosshatched areas. Then peel up the tape slowly. And if the paint pops off with the tape, you don't, you know that you don't have great adhesion. If it stays put, then you're good to go. If you don't have great adhesion on the plastic, if you add a uh, primer like our uh, basics gesso or our professional gesso or our, even our clear gesso, that's a way that uh, you can do it. The clear gesso is quite nice on clear plastic if you have to go that route. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I hope that wasn't too much for what you needed. <laughs> Yes, that happens to me sometimes. I'm like, get down that rabbit hole. But yeah, great question. And that adhesion test, by the way, works if say you want to paint a leather jacket or something, or you want to paint sneakers. You know, we do in our, on our website, we have something called the acrylic book, which details a lot of information on unusual surfaces. But if your unusual surface isn't in there, do that same adhesion test we just talked about, and that will help you to know. All right, now we're to the golden mountain here. So we get to break out our primary yellow. And you'll see that the primary yellow out of, you know, compared to other colors is quite vibrant and very sunny. And we want to soften it a bit. So this is a case where we'll take, a, and I put it like a, like a nickel size amount. We're going to take our cadmium orange shoe. And for this, for right now, we'll put like a, a little less than a nickel size amount of the cadmium orange shoe. And then we're gonna take a dab of our, our already mixed sienna and mix it with our yellow with a dab of the orange, okay? So it's a very, to me, this is like a playful way to work. You're kind of taking the colors, adjusting as you go and uh, refining it as needed. So we're mainly gonna use the primary yellow, but we'll start by adding, say like that's about four drops or dabs of the, um, on your palette knife. And we'll just put that in your nickel size amount of primary yellow. And so that looks a little bit um, cooler than we want, right? It's not, it's not that kind of warm golden kind of sun color, even though it's a mountain, it's just, we want it to look like some of that sun glow is on the mountain. So now we can add a dab of the uh, cad worn shoe to warm it up a bit. And you see how right away that takes it to that uh, sunnier golden color. Now, the only, thing I want to do now is I feel like while I have the hue that I want, it's a little bit darker value. So that's not a big problem. I'll just take the rest of my white that I have here and add that. And if you wanted it even uh, softer or more white, you could uh, certainly, and in fact, I think I'll do that Add a little bit more white to soften it just a bit. And so we'll add that. So that's probably, I added about four dabs of the white to my gold, kind of warm gold color. And I think we'll call that good, okay? So I'll see if I can reuse one of my paper towels here. Gotta have plenty of paper towels handy. <laughs> or if you have a rag, that's a nice way to go to a rag that you can just use different parts of the rag. All right, so I'm, don't worry, we are gonna use our smaller brush, but for the trees, but I felt like it was quickest and, and most, um, it just made more sense to paint most of it with our large size 10. So I'm still gonna pick up that brush, put it in our golden warm yellow and paint in this mountain. So just the same idea doing blocking in some of the larger space first. And then we will uh, stop and do some of the detail. There is a fair amount of white mixed in with this color. So it should be um, fairly opaque for you. But in my case, my pencil lines are fairly dark. So I'm not sure I'll have time in this as we're talking through it. But if I wanted to do a uh, second coat, I could certainly do that. Now, I don't know if you noticed, I got a little bit of my wet sienna because I over overshot the mark on my 
painting here, which I do that all the time. And that's what's nice is this, it's forgiving. You don't have to panic about that if it happens to you. Um, so I'm just gonna try and even out that shape. And I just was able to kind of blend in that sienna from below. So it's pretty darn forgiving there. And now I'm going to come back up here and just guesstimate my rocky ridge. And I know I'm working briskly, everyone. I hope um, you're not feeling too rushed, but I want to make sure we can get to the point where you can feel like you've got a level of completion here. So I'll kind of quickly zoom across the edge. And I think what I'll do, I'm going to turn my canvas, maybe make that a little easier for me. Oh, make sure I'm on screen here. And I, this is a, another good example where even though I'm painting in a fairly small shape and I have a big brush, I can just tilt and turn my brush as needed. If you feel more comfortable with a smaller brush, there's no you know, law or reason why you can't use it. Again, I was just using the larger brush because it does cover more area as you're working. So, but again, even if you pick up the smaller brush at this point, um, you're gonna, you'll need to probably tilt and turn it to fit these roundy edges, the rounded edges. Is roundy a word? I don't really think so, but that's okay, <laughs> it fits. So brush that in. I'm, and here I'm actually twisting the brush um, as I'm painting, just to make sure it fits in the space where I need it. I'm rushing it out. And now I can go over this again, where I kind of overshot the mark where I wanted it to be. I'm gonna flip it back around. So now we've got our golden uh, mountain in the back. The last two, three steps are the sun, the sky, and the clouds. So what we'll do next is the sun. So wipe off your brush, do your water rinse. Marla, well, I just wanna interject that we're coming yeah. on, it's 2.58, so we are gonna run a little over for everyone, but the class is being recorded. And if you have to leave, um, you could see the 24 to 48 hours. Um, at michaels.com backslash classes, also on the Michaels YouTube channel. It's been in the chat. Um, but before we leave, we'll also post, Marla will put her little, um, her taglines so you can reach out to Marla and we'll put the hashtags back up. But, um, and another thing we got, we're getting some nice feedback on our palette. I have to tell you, I love this palette. This is like the mid-century. These colors just are fantastic. So I feel like they really, we, we have so many different art projects that are coming up and we want to have you join us at more yes. classes and uh, check out Michael's YouTube because we have, we'll have videos out there as well. So more basics fluids on its way with projects and um, inspirations to come. Nice. So in case you didn't see that, I had my cad orange hue uh, out and I just took a dab in my existing um, more, uh, my softer white sienna mix. I dabbed it, probably got three dabs of of that color and I'm just mixing it into my orange. Again, I want to soften it. I love the vibrancy of the orange, but like, you know, we're, we're talking about this kind of mid-century modern palette. I want it softened a bit to go with it. So that's why I'm taking this. I'll take another one dab of that Sienna with white, just to kind of get it to uh, live in the same realm as the other colors that we have. So it's still a, it's going to be a vibrant color in comparison, but it, it fits with that family better just by adding a little bit of that color. And I find too, when you're doing a painting and you, and you use a little bit of other colors that you've painted before, that's a way that you can unify the surface of your painting because you're taking colors that exist somewhere else on the piece and you're continuing them throughout the painting. So it's, you know, even though you may not totally see it, it's there and you know it's there and it, and it um, excuse me, becomes evident in the final piece. All right, so I'll move this out of the way. So let's work on our sun now. We've got the color mixed and this is where I'm going to jump to my smaller brush. This is the size six and this is a short flat. You might hear it called a bright. So, so a flat is longer filament. The short bright is like the same idea as a flat edge. It's crispy and it holds color, but it gives you a little tighter control because the filaments are shorter. So that's why you might see it called short flat or another uh, way to call it is a bright. So I'm gonna dip that into my uh, orange mix and just fill in my sun, my circle shape here. 
And this is a case where you want to use the corners of the brush to your advantage. And again, don't hesitate to turn the canvas as needed. And uh, just, there's no rules that you have to keep it exactly where you have it placed. I try to as much as possible just so everyone can see it, but uh, you know, you move it as you need to move it. And so since it's a smaller shape with lots of different crevices, you're gonna probably wanna use the corner of the brush effectively. And we're going to come up around the curve of the sun. So sometimes people, you know, I, I could see how some people might say, why don't you use a pointed, like a round brush? There's no law saying you can't, of course, but I, you know, I often will use a flat, like, or bright, like we're using today, or a filbert, which is like if a round and a flat had a baby, they'd have a filbert because <laughs> it's like a rounded tip with the flat body. And that's a nice uh, marriage of both worlds. But pointed okay. rounds, I feel like are fantastic for line work. I don't prefer them for filling in any amounts of color. Because again, it, you can kind of, unless you really want like a Van Gogh kind of uh, evidence of all the brush mark, which is of course, is really striking. If you're just filling in color and you want it to be more flat, I feel like that adds unnecessary texturing. So while it might feel a little unwieldy to use this uh, wider brush in a small shape, uh, I just feel like it ultimately is is a, a stronger way to fill in that shape uh, based on brush stroking. So I didn't fill in the, the sphere uh, quite exactly in this pass, and that's okay because I can then touch it up a bit as we put the, the, uh, the blue-gray sky around it. So I'll stop there, and I'm going to wipe my brush. And now let's go ahead and we'll do our clouds, and then we're going to finish with the blue-gray sky. So the clouds are a lighter version of the gold that we have. So if you, hopefully you have a little bit of extra gold left, I'm gonna scrape up what I have. Uh, if you don't have enough to scrape up, remember it's the primary yellow, uh, a touch of the burnt sienna with white and a, a very small touch of the orange. So you could mix that up again, but we don't need a lot of it for the clouds because it's mainly white. So I add a little bit more of my white here, about a dime size amount. I will dip my palette knife. We only have a few clouds, so I don't need to mix a ton of it. Um, and the other thing I remember that I did too is I added actually a little bit of the Sienna mix that we have next to it, just to kind of soften it and get it a little, um, so I'm adding another two to three dabs here just a little closer to a neutral, not the, not quite the gold of the mountain. So more of like a, a golden brown. And mixing this up a bit, I feel like, okay, I needed a little bit lighter value. So now I'm gonna add more white. So say four dabs of white. I'm gonna mix that into that mixture. And let's see how that looks compared to what I have here. It's a little more golden. And add some more white. So another four to five dabs of the white. Mix that in. And as everyone knows, it's like when you repaint a painting, even though unless I, I didn't make specific formulas, it's going to look close. It's not going to look completely exact. And honestly, I, as an artist, I, I'm good with that. I don't want to feel like I'm a a copy machine. <laughs> so every painting has its own day and its own life. All right, so I'll pick up my smaller brush now and I'm gonna put it into this softer, more white added uh, tone for the sky, for the clouds. Sorry, forgive me for the clouds. I'll move this over and I'm gonna move my canvas where I can, I'm gonna hold it up just to help me have a little control up here. And I'll start with this cloud at the top. And what's nice about these colors, um, to, per what Jeannie was talking about, the mid-century modern, is that they really do relate nicely to each other. It's kind of a, I guess the word is what, a, I guess it'd be a considered just a complementary color palette, or maybe double complementary, because you have the blue and the orange. Mm -hmm. 
and then variations on that. So I think it's why one reason why we find it so pleasing. So this is like a, an evening sky where, in my mind anyways, where that kind of golden hour is approaching the sky. It's a big sunset and the clouds are warmed up and it's shining down on the mountains. And so we're just kind of stroking in the wispy clouds that have been given some color by the sunset. And I'm not even really following my pencil mark other than a general idea. And then now we're gonna tie it all up with our blue gray sky. And then we've got the trees at the end. So, okay, let's, let's get moving. <laughs> all right. So let's do this. Um, I don't know about you and your palette. I'm going to flip mine. So I have a little bit of a clean working area here. So just make sure you have a clean working area. I will put out a tiny, we'll go ahead and make some fresh color of this. I'll put the tiniest dab of primary blue. And I could use this white, but just to kind of make it clear for you on the screen, I'm going to add a new amount of white. Let's say, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, bigger than the nickel size amount of titanium white. And then we have some of the orange. We'll need that in a second. So what I'll do, I'll start by taking a dab. Again, less is more. I wanna make sure I don't overdo it. So I'll just add a dab of our primary blue into this white. And it is that vibrant, um, more electric blue. Mm. So we want to soften it a bit and gray it down in the best way. So I'll take another little dab of blue to get it closer in value to the blue sky that we have. I could take another, so that's three dabs of blue to a little over a nickel size amount of white. And then I'm going to dab my palette knife into the orange for the sun. We'll start with one dab. It got a little covered by my paint already on there. So I'll take another dab. So that's two dabs of the orange. This is a little trick that you can use effectively if it's not something you're familiar with, but if you want to soften a color, you can add a dab of the complement to do so. And so orange and blue are complements, the complementary colors. And so see how that gives you a really lovely gray? It's not quite the gray I'm going for. My sky is a little bit bluer, so I can add a little more blue at this point. But that's what's nice about it. Now that I've got the tone from the orange, I can just um, add the rest of my dab of blue to get that slightly deeper blue gray. And there you go. Now, if you wanted, I think in my original, I had a little bit more, I had a little bit of the phthalo green. So I'm actually going to just put a dab of that out because what's on my palette is dry. I'm going to take the teeniest tiny dab of phthalo green to add to that. So just one little tiny dab. And that's where now it's a little, it sings a little bit more with my existing green blue, right? There, yeah, I think I'm good with that. Hopefully you're good with yours. And clean my knife and I'll paint in the sky. I'm going to grab my uh, size 10 again, just to cover more area. Oops, a little bit of a blob in there. So remember what I said too, this is a case where you can block in the, the large passages of um, sky and then just more slowly go around your, your, your clouds and your sun and whatnot. For the long passages of the, of, the, of the clouds, I can go ahead and do that now because I'm it's easy enough to do that. But around the sun, I'll probably slow down a bit and be a little more careful. Refine it, I guess I should say, refine a little better. Same here with butting up to the mountain. So it's very much, you know, responding as you go to the painting, what you feel like you need to do next. I'm just uh, going there. And yeah, I think that I really love how this gray blue interacts with the orange and gold in the sky. It just sets it all off. 
And it's a fairly soft muted color, but it still has a brilliance to it, partly because of how it's used with the other colors and, the, and they're playing really nicely off each other, but also I think due to the, the, the vibrancy of the paint itself. So you can have a toned down color and not have it be sad, right? It can still have a, a life to it. Good point. Um, yeah. yeah. There's still like a vividness because it does. It just feels very um, warm, you know, because. Yeah, that's, it's that's, rich. It, yeah, it's exactly saturated. Yeah, it's rich. Saturated. That's a good one, too. Yeah, it's definitely saturated. I feel like yeah. these colors are very. And that's what's crazy to me, because being in like an everyday range, it's like, wow, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a, you know, it's a great. It's the, start with, sure. when you're, the pigments that you're referring, that's what's giving you this clarity when you are doing all these mixes, you know, that's, that's the, the art, quality yeah. of the pigments that, that are being used. So that's really a nice distinction that Liquitex has. Yes, I definitely agree. Because you can use other brands, kind of more introductory brand. And it, in my experience, it's pretty evident. Um, but uh, with, uh, whenever we have a different kind of everyday acrylic from Liquitex, it, it can be as good, if not better, than some other brands' more professional ranges. So, yeah. yeah, it's definitely good to not think of it as a, this is a lesser range. It's just different depending on your needs. Yeah, we, we talked about that because we refer to it as the everyday acrylic because it's not something that you're going to use and then forget about because it stays uh -huh. inside your, you know, within your studio. I mean, it's got, it has great properties that mix with our professional ranges as well. Definitely. So yeah, we're trying to get it. So it's the everyday acrylic. So now we're glad that we were able to expand the range and give you a different viscosity. And once again, I know we've run over, but it's getting taped the class. It'll be available 24 to 48 hours. And then Marla put in her hashtag. Um, also, um, excuse me, hashtag Michael's make, make it with Michael's. Yep. Um, and then you're at Marla Morrison Art on Instagram. And as we said, tag Michaels if you want to be considered for their um, UGC uh, gallery, which is um, included in their emails. Otherwise, just share it with us. And at the end, we're going to have everybody give us a quick glimpse of what you've created. My favorite part. Yeah. Same with that. Uh, same with me. It's just love everyone's interpretations. Definitely. And everyone has their unique eye and their style. So, all right. So, this I could finesse a little bit more, but um, I think in the interest of moving forward, I'm going to just take that curve out. See, I was able to do that really nicely because I have my more opaque mixture here. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's about where I want it. So let's, I want to make sure I have a chance to show you the, how to put the trees in. So this is where, where you will need some more Mars Black and you will need your uh, smaller brush, your size six. So I will put more Mars Black out, about a dime size amount, don't need a ton of it. And when we look at the original, you can see we've got kind of a cluster here and an individual, another cluster, and a few at the bottom. You, of course, can do whatever you want. Just notice that in order to give that illusion of depth, some of your taller ones are in the front and they get a little bit smaller as they go back. So I'm gonna start with this one um, in the front here. Uh, it's actually, I see it as sitting on this ridge, kind of curving behind our view. Excuse me, so I'll take my smaller size six, dip it into the black, and I'm going, this is where I'm going to use the, the uh, tip of my brush. Uh, let's see if I can verbalize it, kind of pointing down and making a thin straight line. Make sense? So just that's going to give me a thin, imagining like the center structure of the tree. And now I'll turn my knife and now I'm going to use the point of my knife. I'm uh, sorry, I keep saying knife, sorry, the point, the edge of my brush. Just the, the corner is more precise there. Sorry, guys, the corner, of my, sorry, everyone, the corner of my brush to feather in the uh, branches of these evergreen trees. There we go. Sometimes it's hard for me to verbalize when I am painting. Okay, so there, and we'll do another here. That's where I love these, the flat or the short flat for that 
corner on the brush that can help with fine detail. And you can see too, because the basics fluid is um, rich and pigmented, but very fluid in texture, I can do this fine detail work without issue. And we'll do another here. And again, I'm just using the, the corner of my brush to feather in some branches. Very, very loose. Now I'm going to put another here. Now this one is like on the back side of my lighter blue mountain. So that kind of makes it so I'm not going to have it cover the, this blue stripe. I don't know if you can see that. Let me zoom in. Mm. So I'm having it go behind this mountain here. And if you look at this up close, you know, it's not super refined, but when we look at it all together in this context, we're like, oh yeah, trees in the landscape. So mm. that's what's really freeing about it too. You don't have to feel. And now you notice too, I'm not dragging down because I'm, oh good, it is dry. But you yeah. can dab it in a line like I did, or you can drag it straight down. Uh, but that fluidity makes it quite easy to. Now more question just in general with your acrylic paints and like I've done it um we have a person that's asking about if they were open but they were tightly shut what you know what's the shelf life ah yeah yeah so I mean yeah, you could answer away because I know I have stuff sure. that's around for years yeah yeah definitely the way you know Liquitex talks about it is the shelf life of unopened dark materials is about eight to ten years and once it's opened, it's really difficult to pre fully predict remaining shelf life because so much depends on how you store it, mm -hmm. you know, store it in an attic versus, or basement versus comfortable room temperature that can shorten the life. But, you know, I've found if I tightly cap my acrylics or mediums and I keep them in my studio, I don't put them in the garage and even some I put in the garage and they're still fine. But as a general rule, if I want to make sure it's protected, I keep it in comfortable room temperature I mean, I've had some colors for decades now and they're still fine. You might say, well, why haven't used the color? Well, sometimes I have some color that I just haven't used in a while and I'll find that it's still good. But uh, with, or I'll have a big container of a medium that I don't use all the way. And, and this is another thing too, if you have a giant container of something, one little trick you can do, um, I'll just use the example. Say you have a, like our gloss gel medium, you could, in a bucket, you could top it on a table to flatten the amount that's still in the, um, container and then take some distilled water and put it in a spray bottle and spritz the top of the flattened gloss gel and then put like a layer of plastic wrap over the opening of the container and what you're doing there is you're keeping you're helping minimize the chance that the air inside the container is going to dry out the medium while it's sitting mm -hmm. So I'm probably giving you way too much info, but in the case <laughs> of the fluids, they're so fluid in the bottle, you know, they're going to create a level surface when they're stored. I would just say, keep it tightly capped. And I would predict you'll have many, many years of life out of it, probably way more than the eight to 10. But I know that that's kind of what Liquitex will talk about is eight to 10 years shelf life unopened. So, yeah, and that's the thing too, you know, some, if you ever run into a problem with any paint that you buy and you feel like, oh, this didn't last as long as I should have, you know, no, don't ever hesitate to contact the tech support mm -hmm. because I know I'll, I will help out on that line. And we're, we definitely want to make sure people are happy with Liquitex materials because, you know, we know that things happen and it could have been in the store longer than anyone realized. And so we do stand behind our materials. So just be aware of that too. Yeah, very true, very true. And there's just like a wealth of knowledge there as well. If you ever have any technical questions, both the website and then the tech line, and that's um, has been listed on the products. Yes. So, so I've got those trees in. I'm gonna do two final trees here and you can keep doing trees. Too. <laughs> you have a big forest this time. Yeah. So everything is different. Every time we have these sessions, you, uh, it always looks different. Like Marla said, not one piece is ever gonna be exact. That's right. That's the beauty right. of art. That's right. If we wanted, I mean, we could do it, well, and even digital arts, the whole different animal, but I could make an easy digital copy, but this is not digital copy. This is real life copy, so a little different. All right, so I think we'll call that done with the trees.
We'll zoom out here. I can do some more refining on it. And, you know, depending on what you want, you could certainly do that too. But I think we've um, gotten as pretty close as we're going to get in this session to our original. And I would love to see if you painted with, I'd love to see what you did. So I guess I need to go to gallery view. Yeah, let's check it out. I want, yeah, if everybody could share with us. Wow. Fantastic. Ooh, I'm not seeing it. How do I get oh. to the page? Oh, there we go. Yeah. 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 Okay. We uh, need more people to show. No, um, what wow, unique color palette. Oh, very oh. pretty. Cool. Marissa, Sabina. Well done, everyone. Oh, I like your trees in the front. Nice. Yeah, I do too. Oh my gosh, so many pretty colors. Thanks so much for sharing. That's fantastic. Well fantastic. done, everyone. Well, I'm glad that you were here joining us and um, hopefully you had a wonderful experience. Thank you, Marla. Um, great as usual. Lots of great information. I encourage you to try um, the Liquitex fluids and you can get them at Michael's and um, hopefully we'll see you again on another class soon. So we'll let Marla wrap it up for us. Yeah, thanks so much, Jeannie. Thanks everyone for being here. I really appreciate it. And uh, Chanel, can you put me on so I can wave goodbye? <laughs> awesome, thanks. Thanks so much for spending your time painting with me. I absolutely love it. Um, I'd love to see you in other classes down the road and take advantage of this wonderful opportunity Michaels has given us as artists to try all different sorts of things. And don't hesitate to share this class too with friends who may have missed it because that's another fun thing to do is be able to share your knowledge with others. So thanks so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Great.